thank you very much for coming. Uh, I don't know about you, David, but I, I kind of didn't think, well, maybe this isn't working, maybe this doesn't work. But this is, I guess, going to be a series of indeterminate length. Uh, and it's kind of up to all of us to, to get out of it uh, as much as we need. So uh, I think David will we'll keep running, we'll keep facilitating. Mm -hmm. uh, as um, as much as you know, you want to learn, and as much as you guys uh, and gals want to achieve as well. Um, so, broadly, uh, what I think both of us, when we got together, wanted uh, was to actually get people to to teach themselves. Uh, and, um, and have more of a discussion session rather than uh, a sort of lecture session, which is very informational, but that's then all information you've got to keep in your head. Uh, right at this time where it's stressful, you're in a, a busy climb. I think what we're wanting to leave people with and what we're wanting to learn ourselves is, is analysis, is decision making, and then perhaps something that's special about, about the Dales. Um, so just a little preamble before we get on to the homework and the discussion. Are we all warm enough? Yeah. Uh, we're getting value, we're getting value for money on the heating here. Um, so I've just put it together a few things to frame the whole set of sessions. What are we doing when, when, when we're trying to fly XC? Um, and it, it boils down to staying in the air. And then you add on to that staying in the air uh, in a different location to where you started off, to where you got to a satisfactory destination. And you know, you get to choose the satisfactory in that because. You know, you're going XC for, for your own reasons. And we can discuss those reasons, you know, philosophically in the pub sometime uh, when we don't have some homework to discuss. Um, and it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, birds with pretty small brains do this. Uh, if you, you know, you've been up close to a raptor or a, a hawk or a, uh, particularly a kite, They've got really small heads, and most of that head is eye, <laughs> and then the rest of it is, is parts of their brain that deal with what they see. So the actual technique for flying must be a very, very small part of the brain. Like, you know, hey, <laughs> So it struck me that, that, you know, it can't be that hard. Uh, I've, I've had a look at this on, the, on the, the computing side of things, and, you know, there's a program called Pilot. It runs on a tiny microcontroller, which is a, a very, very small, cheap piece of silicon. Uh, and that will keep a, a glider in the air. If there's air going up, it will keep the glider going around in the air uh, for as long as you want, until it can't find some more um, uh, rising air. And, and people generally fly well after 500 hours. Obviously, the problem being that, that 500 hours is a lot of hours in the air. Um, and that's difficult to get. But then again, you've got to balance that. We're learning uh, not in, you know, we're not learning as a toddler. We're not learning like we're at school when we were at absolute learning machines. So... Mm -hmm. I, I treat myself that I'm learning with, with some shonky old hardware. Uh, and that means some exceptions, maybe. It's not what we were designed to do, right? But yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> quite, quite right. Uh, Tom was saying it's not what we're designed to do. We're, we're not designed to, to work in a 3D environment, I guess. I don't know, I disagree with that. I think, oh. so I, I think humans are learning machines. We, we learn and we can learn anything, pretty much. So, you know, we weren't designed to, as, as hunter gatherers, we're not designed to drive cars or to do anything else. It's, it's, Good point. it's the brains of heavy plastic and can learn anything. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
And, uh, but it's a, it's a complex task. So uh, that plastic learning has got to cope with sight, sound, feel, and then put together a whole story about what, what the air is doing. Uh, if you don't know that, you can't make decisions that are going to be right uh, at the time. Uh, and then, Dave, Dave uh, your great point. Uh, you're left on the ground after a, 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 a flight. Maybe there's people flying over you. Uh, maybe you've flown the furthest, but it's still not, you know, you still could have got to. But you're left on the ground thinking, what went wrong? I, I, you know, I, I haven't got a clue. Uh, I don't know why I didn't connect with anything on the way down. It, it was 10 kilometers since my last climb. There should have been something. So you, part of that feedback mechanism that makes learning, uh, you know, super quick sometimes, if you don't have that feedback, that's a real problem in, in learning quickly, I think. So I think uh, slow motion Frogger, if anybody remembers 8-bit games. No, you're all far too young. <laughs> <laughs> slow motion Frogger with, with all of the logs removed from view. <laughs> so for me, it, it's uh, because I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been flying 20 years-ish. Uh, I've had a reasonable apprenticeship um, and I am on about 600 and something hours of flying time at the moment. Uh, and, and so let's work on making that apprenticeship of 500 hours of flying of, of as, shorter, uh, as short as we can. Because uh, it can be a bit demoralizing, you know, sort of 10K, 20K, back to 10K, um, when you know that the day is offering a, a little bit more. Uh, so there's, there's a bunch of ways around that. There's glider technique. Uh, and glider technique is not really what we can teach you in, in or teach ourselves in a room. But that's, that's ground handling. That's, that's all the good stuff you, you know. Um, there's observation, the innate abilities that, that you carry with you, uh, your vision, what you notice, how much attention you can take away from actually concentrating on climbing to uh, your attention for thinking. Because climbing is, is your, your time when you're, you're practicing a skill that should be semi-automatic, much like driving and having a conversation with somebody else. You've done a shed load of driving uh, and you can plan what you're going to do at the destination. You can, you can have a chat with somebody quite satisfactorily. Uh, so that semi-automatic skill of, of climbing uh, as uh, you, was, you were saying about Nick Payne, yeah. as you were saying about Nick Payne, David, uh, that uh, Nick's got a, a tremendous amount on his, on his mind as he's going up. Learning the food. <laughs> um, but that third point is, is both decisions and attitude based on, on some knowledge. Uh, to give you uh, a plan for the flight, to give you your, your tactical decision, uh, and then start thinking ahead, 20, 30K, what, where do I need to be? What's my airspace? What is my long-term set of conditions like downwind? Rinse and repeat to the coast. Uh, and then, just like I've said before, I think we learn this. So, uh, as I say, lectures are kind of a bit information dense, uh, and there's very, you know, there's very little chance. I mean, I, I don't retain, retain things that I heard in class when it, it's the right time to recall that piece of information. However, if you've if you've analysed, if you've seen tracks if you've seen other people's experiences in the same situation uh, then that is more likely to stick i think and if if in these sessions we do go a bit information dense then it's going to be uh 
uh, I guess, flying applied to the, to the Dales because David's done uh, so much analysis on that. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So, David, right. go. Okay. Um, I, hold on, I'll just check everything's going wrong. Yeah. For the folks on Zoom, uh, everything's good? Give me a thumbs up or a, a yes. Yeah, everything's good for me. Yeah, yeah everything's fine for me. Okay. Okay, hi guys. Um, um, this is David May. I would be an aspiring XC pilot. I'm certainly not proficient, I'm not nearly in the same league as Pete, for instance, who was just talking. But what I have decided for myself is because uh, I've got a young family, so I cannot possibly get enough of time in the year that I want. Right? So there's a real um, compromise there in uh, the best way, to, as far as I'm concerned, the best way to learn flying XC is to fly XC. Now, that's number one. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But if you're like me, you can't possibly put in enough time to satisfy it. So I've been looking for ways to improve my analysis when I'm on the ground so that when I get in the year, I can make the most out of it. Um, like any sport, if you want to learn something, you have to put time in. So if you want to learn flying to fly XC, you have to fly XC more. In other words, stay in the air more as you're flying XC. Um, so if you can learn to spend more time in the year, you will get better. And then you spend more time in the year and you will get better. It's, it's like a self-propagating thing. But if you make mistakes all the time and the same mistakes, you will spend less time flying XC. You'll be on the ground very early and you won't have learned that thing. And you'll come out again, who knows, in the next two or three weeks, you'll do the same thing again. You'll be on the ground early and you won't have learned that thing. And you're wasting your time. So... How do we learn just to stay in the air so that that air time gives you your learning time? That's your, that's your training time. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out that. So that's my, uh, that's my incentive, really, in, in these classes. I want to learn from other people. What do they do? What do they do? Why do they make better decisions than me? You know, how do they stay in the air? Now, from my observations, the decisions are not complex at all. In fact, the decision-making process of the good pilots seems to be really simple. They don't get confused. It's a very simple process. Whereas I find I have so many up, uh, I have so many options when I get to base. I don't know which one to pick. My my decision-making is complex, and I think that's why I'm on the ground early because I don't have a simplified structure to make decisions. I am trying to look at everything rather than just what's relevant. So I'm hoping that from these sessions, we can all talk about things and go, we come up with a simplified set of decision ways of making the decision so that it's easy. You're in the air. You don't have to think about 50 different things. You think about three. So um, what I'm going to do is bring you through um, the way I analyze flights to try and understand what went wrong. Why did one person go further than I went on that same day and tried to find the actual point that was the crux that I made a mistake at. So, and the way I do that is with Google Earth. I'll go straight into that, I guess. And I'll show you a few things. Well, the first, actually, the first thing I want to show you is, um, one second now, let me put this down. Oh, that's all right. Just drag it up to the top screen, which is displaying. No, where's the Excel file? Ah, bloody hell. Uh, I think I forgot to bring the Excel file over. Oh, I have it on that. Uh, okay, I'll show you the Google Earth. So first, um, I wanted to show you, uh, I, I wrote a program to pull down all the IG, IGC files from XC League going back to, I think 2003 is what they make available. And this is everything that's up on XC League, not just the best six from every pilot per year. This is every single IGC file. So I pulled them all down. Um, there's about what, five gigabytes worth of IGC files. There's some. There is a lot. <laughs> and then stuck them all into Excel, pulled out various bits of data from them, like the um, of start time, the end time, the straight line distance, 
maximum height they, they achieved above takeoff before they went on their first glide, just trying to get an idea, you know, what height should I be, for instance, above wind bank before I start going on XC? Is there, is there an average height? There'll always be outliers, like um, one of them, I think Jake went off and he was practically on the ground out over the valley. But most people leave about, um, about two and a half thousand feet uh, and going up, that's what most people use as you go over the wall and wind bank. So I can show you that. Uh, I'm just going to remove. Is that above camera? Yeah, no, above sea level. I am no. Right. Um, the other thing that uh, was very handy, which I'll pick that up in a, in a bit, is one of the things I wanted to figure out, would the data show me that a sea wing has a significant advantage over a B wing to fly XC? And I'm only looking at downwinders from sites in the Dales. And the answer is no. Downwinders from the Dales, there isn't, and if I can pull up those graphs, I'll put them up from the other PC. You'll see that really the, the sea wing doesn't give you that much, a slight advantage, but not that much, not nearly as much as you might think, which means if you think by moving up a wing, you will fly further, you won't. At least the data doesn't show that you will. So. But is that the same between the bottom B and the top? No, I, I don't have that level of data. So it's just B's and C's, you know? Um, yeah, because it, it doesn't record a top or a bottom B on the XE it's, it's kind of hard to show. Closing the difference between, you know, sort of the nylon mental. Hey, why isn't this shown up here? Quite far apart. Between the, the yeah, I, mean, I, I think they're, they're far apart in handling. Um, Please. Yeah. Why isn't Google Earth showing on the. Just drag that. Drag this, up. yeah. So the big screen is above the screen. I don't think so. I'll drag this up there. Yeah. No, you do. Yes. <laughs> or just um, if you repeat the screens, it might be easier to duplicate the screens. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll get to find out where I am. All right, so I'm looking at the screen up here then. <laughs> right. Oh. Right. So these are all. Oh, your your uh, laptop is no faster than mine. Well, generally, it's not too bad, but uh, it could be that it's uh, recording. All right. Could be, could be slow. Streaming. Anyhow. These are all the IGC files from Windbank since 2016 for B wings and C wings. Okay, so you can see that there's a couple of long ones, a couple of short ones. Uh, there we go. If I then show you this, it should open up. Right, 25K middle circle, 50K, 25K and 100. So you can very quickly see, and I've broken down all the data into those four bands. Okay, so I'll take that off again. One of the interesting things, if you look at the graphs in Excel, is uh, I looked at the graphs in Excel to see from the five sites, we have our five main sites, Windbank, Simmer, Dodd, Weather, and Stags. There isn't an advantage, at least not a significant advantage between Bs and Cs for all of those sites, except one band. Or 75 band here. 25 band, the Bs actually take it. The 50 band, broad average between Bs and Cs, they both pretty much have the same number of flights. The 75 kilometer band here, 
the C's are significantly an advantage for some reason. Why? Experience? No, because the other sites, there isn't a significant advantage on any of the hands. Mm. The C's have a minor advantage on each hand, but it's kind of consistent. Wind bank, it's, it's significant. At that distance, you're going to hit a headwind of three CB or something, and therefore you get that penetration. Oh, you need so no, I not really. Yeah. Not really. Weather and Dodd generally work across the country like that as well. Yeah. And roughly the same, roughly the same um, areas you're getting to. So let me see if I can pull in our airspace. If you summer on a longer flight, then you will hit sea breeze around Carlisle. Uh, oh. You do valley before Carlisle. Yeah. Oh. Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> right. 25, 50, 75. For some reason, the Bs manage to keep up with the Cs if they're just doing a 25K, the 50, but trying to get across that 50 to 75 barrier, the Cs have a big advantage. And why is that? I think it's because of this here. Um, between... 25 and the 50 you have to navigate around that and then you have to decide to go left or right to get around this this block here in order to get into the 75 it's like crosswind yeah it's this it's this little crux here and if um if, if i showed that for the other sites there isn't as significant a sort of a like this is like a big wall in the middle of your you generally want to be flying kind of that way if, if you head off this way, you're going to go straight into that. So you have to figure your way around that. But you also have to figure your way around these two. That would be in Feltham, mm. arranging Sarah around Labour and Richmond. Anchoring. Yeah. Um, so I think this particular combination of airspace causes a problem for uh, the less experienced pilot. And puts them on the ground they do really well i mean if you can get to 50k or 40k you're around about here i mean you've done really well you put together four or five thermals together so you're well able to go xc but this might well be your first experience of trying to navigate around quite complex airspace and the seas just do it better not because of the wing i think it's because of the pilots who are flying the seas um whereas if you look at the other um sites you don't have the same, just that same sort of bottleneck of airspace on, the, um, on any of the bands. But I think that answers the question, why is a wind bank hard for bees to break into the 75 kilometer mark? Because you have to get around this. Yeah. Right, the other thing that I was hoping to find out from the data, excuse me, I want to see that, so is we don't need that airspace. No need that. What's that that's right now? Uh, that's just, uh, I'll tell you now who it is. Is that somebody who put a, an observation? For no, it time? isn't. That's Kevin is one of these stray uh, GPS marks. Sometimes the um, your IGC <laughs> trackers go haywire. And, uh, some of them go up to the moon and some of them go off you know, halfway around the world. It's just a bad bad point in the IGC. Ke Kevin's online. Kevin. Kevin, why have you been breaking David's <laughs> data? Uh, this is no, apologies, I don't remember that. Right. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I just happened to find it hard to. Right, here we go. So this is Google Pro, or is it? Not... Yeah, but it's free. Yeah, oh, it's free. Yeah. yeah. All right. So the other thing that I was interested was from the data, and I think this is really relevant to people who haven't done a huge amount of XC. When you get into a thermal on winter and you go up, when you're high enough to keep going, when you when you're high enough to hold back, you know, do you know what's the average height people have on winter as they go over the back? It's useful to know. And um, I picked um, a pick the landmark, I picked the wall that runs the length of the wind bank, the back of the wind bank. 
if you're going up in the thermal and you, you feel you're kind of centered in it, you're going up. What height do you need to be over that wall before you should start to go over the back? So it's two and a half thousand feet. If you're at two and a half thousand feet and you're still going up at that wall, it's game on. You know? Now, people have gone much higher than that, going over the back. Very few go below it and still manage to resume the next. Okay. So, two and a half thousand feet is a rule of thumb. Now, as you get better and you can feel thermals, you find some people have taken off and the thermal has been quite, um, quite a narrow for them. It hasn't been straight up like that, like that. So they've gone across the, um, the point of that wall quite low, but they obviously know what they're doing and they can feel the thermal and they stay with it. And they get quite high. It's just a long way back behind the hill. But most people, and we'll see it here as we go through these, most of the um, flights that go XC from Windbound are very high going over that wall. You're also looking to see if there's a climb downwind as well on the Buckingham Pike. For sure. So you can see if it's working, but if there's a cloud of a Buckingham Pike, that looks like it's working. Right. That also factors into your decision. So that's one thing we can't do here with Google Earth. You obviously can't see the sky, and the sky is very relevant for XC because everybody says once you get high, you're flying the clouds. So you're not really looking at your terrain, you're going from cloud to cloud to cloud. If you're lucky, you can just stay up there and bounce through clouds. You obviously can't do that. Um, you can't factor that in when you're looking at Google Earth, unless you're looking at tracks that you flew, because you remember the flight. I find I remember the flights. I remember the sky. Um, so you will remember, oh, that was a big blue hole there. And huh, fancy, look at that, I'm on the ground two minutes later, you know? And oh, that's why Jake happened to skirt around to the north, you know, 10 minutes earlier. I go, Jake, where's he going? He's going up around the north. And then you go back and you look at him and go, ah, I see. Because I remember now. That was a big blue hole and I just went straight into it, you know? So I find the, the best flights to analyze are your own flights compared to somebody else who's flown on the same day from the same place at the same time. Well, those tracks, they just all went up and got and got huge differences as they went across the time. And some of them just went up and then just bumbled along. Mm. Mm. You think that two and a half thousand feet might be relative, say, wind ramp was a, a thousand feet? You think that remaining one and a half thousand feet might be relative to the cross country from any side? Uh, it's, it's pretty much is, but uh, I haven't fully analysed all the other sides yet. So I would show you. So I brought a visual aid. Good bike. Uh, and we're really approaching the southern tip is, is where we're taking the blind bag up. You know, what, what always strikes me uh, is how quick you're across the planet. Yeah. It is no distance whatsoever. Yeah. Oh. And, and for me, you know, particularly, you know, it's in the South West um, you're leaving from the South End, getting high to Buckingham and Starbottom never works as well as you think it should be doing because it's a bigger hill. Uh, and it's actually got some, some texture on it that should actually be really effectively acting as a trigger. Um, is that Great Wernside in that book? Uh, so this is Great Wernside here. Oh, right. This is Buckingham Pike, this is Starbottom Fell. Uh, I think the good height normally works as you predict. So given the wind direction for the shape of the train, yeah. if you go to the spot where you think it's going to be working, it, it normally is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, certainly Joe will attest to this a couple of times uh, in two years, actually. Uh, and the, actually, the harness I've got now, is that the one that was hit by the ram? Kind of quite possibly, yeah. When you're landing, okay. <laughs> uh, so that, so that kind of attests to the difficulty of, of coming over here and establishing this. It is a higher hill, so it's it's so easy to feel as though you've got that height to get away from from wind bang. But in effect, 
you've definitely got to connect on a climb here. Yeah. Because you've got a bigger, you know, you've got another 300, 400 foot to climb. Uh, so and, um, and a little bit more than that, because this is all high ground here. So you've got to be at a height where you've established yourself, where you've got some thinking time and some searching distance. On on this day, I don't know can my but what I um, I didn't get away. Yeah, I, um, I missed getting in the climb with most people who got away. So and I then, did. Yeah, and then I got I was further up the ridge um, and got a climb, and the wind drift was taking me straight up up the bike. So I just thought, right, good. Up the I can't remember for life what the sky was like that, but right, but it's high, I'll go there. Yeah. So over the top of Dave Smart, who was an instant out down the right. Dave, Dave Smart, yeah. And I landed on top of the back, I didn't, I got one tiny little bit of it, and then just, oof, yeah, straight to my house. And I go, what the fuck? What's that with the, with the crown to me? I can only remember the sky in one flight where I definitely took those with the and flew around the cloud, around the edge of the that wasn't it's, but some of those flights, the ones that seem to get the furthest, look like they went direct north rather than north north. No, on that day, um, there were no. two people that got converted. One was Ed, and he went no. pretty much west, and Alex pretty much went northwest. Two very good groups. Yeah, that's what my point. There was common, there was common ground for. The, yeah, so the, the common ground is, is something we'll cover. But, but my point was, was, instead of going across the valley and then trying to work along the valley, they sort of went um, crosswind, downwind, but across to go further north to then before they then started tracking back northeast. Okay, well, hold that thought. We'll, we'll come to it in, in a this, little bit. Because the other, the other problem was, was that when, they, when everybody seemed to get to the valley, the wide piece of the valley with Labour in the bottom of it, a lot of people went down there. Okay. Where, where the was uh, so, so like Labour like and Like Pete Darwin and stuff. Yeah. You know, quite a lot of people seemed to get to that point and then it looked from Google Earth. I don't even think about it, but that it's quite a long, wide bowl. Any, many any, people made across the any, any way you look at it, uh, at the height that you are in the Dales, Wesley Dales and Long Crossing. Right. There, there will always be casualties going across Wensley Gale. However, however, that's a very interesting thing, is that? <laughs> Uh, to the west of, of Penhill, keep your eyes out for, for that fold because that, that fold does, does work actually. Anyway, there you go. All right, so just I'm just showing you the um, what I'm calling an exit line. So I created this exit line along Windbank. This is 2500 feet from sea level and it runs right along the wall at the back of Windbank. So this is not something that I'm intended to be of any use to somebody who's familiar with leaving Windbank. This is of use to somebody who isn't familiar with leaving Windbank. To have a rough idea, should I keep going or should I go back to the front? All right. That's at 2,500 feet. And I'm just going through all of them, the flights that have uh, had an XC greater than 10K from Windbank so in the last five years. And you see practically all of them. This one, okay, it's slightly below 2,500 feet crossing the wall, but they're obviously very strong climbing <laughs> because they went up to here. Uh, I think it was. Tim, Tim. Uh, interestingly enough, Tim got to there and then he decided to come all the way back to the front. <laughs> down here, went back up again. I suspect what happened here is he was waiting for somebody. Yeah, I haven't talked to him. Yeah. But the point is he, he actually left on his XC lower than when he was there earlier on in the day. But both of them, you can see he's way, way above that 2,500. Take the next day on. Again, most of them are at least over the 2,500 and going up. Go through them all. No, if, if you go through them all, you can go through them all like that. Now, what I want to do is pick out a particular day, which was, how oh, was it? Uh, yes. 
I don't know if I got this, who is that? Yes, Mart and me. Yes, that's the one, because I can see where I landed here. Uh, I'm going to take that day for, so both myself and Dave Smart got less than 25K. And if we go into the 50Ks on that day, was this one? We have two people who got Jake and Pete managed to get between 25 and 50. And we had 75 on that same day was these two here. And that was, come on. Chris Fountain and Pete Logan managed to get 75 and then 200 was Ed and Alex. Now, the interesting thing is everybody in that list, that's eight people, everybody except Ed and Pete Logan were fine together, took out together in the same gaggle together. We all got over into Buckley Pike together. Um, <clears throat> so what I, I was going to show, because I was one of them, so I can remember this slide. So I'm just going to show myself. There's a couple of interesting, oh, come on. There's Pete. Pete Darwood is an interesting point. And me. The reason I'm talking about Dave Smart went off and did his thing. He didn't do very well at all that day. I'm going to get rid of that ribbon because we don't need it. But you know he retook it off. Yeah. So um, just let me get my colors right. So I'm red and somebody else is red. So it's just going to make me green. Ah, all right. Okay. Right. So uh, let's see if I can. So I am red. I made some mistakes on this slide. No, I am not red. I'm green. So as you can see on this slide, I remember when I took off, I intentionally held back. So if we start moving forward, you'll see the three of us moving. So this is you, Pete. Pete was quite slow, actually. Pete was behind everybody. This is myself and Pete Darwood. I just want to add one more person in. It's said Chris. Hopefully he is in the same. Oh, yes, he's green. What color is Chris? Green. I'll give Chris yellow. <clears throat> Right, Chris is yellow. Okay, who is that? That's Chris. So Chris is in the thermal that myself and Pete Darwood are in. He's just a little bit lower. Right? And Pete is faffing around there. So let's move on. Right, as you can see, Pete is still faffing around down here. But Chris, myself, and Pete Darwood are pretty much, and there was, uh, the others are Jake Herber, Herbert, Alex, a couple of more people were in this thermal together. I, I might be ready with our first visual demonstration. Uh -huh. <laughs> ah. So <sighs> what happened with me trying to get away? Because I was a little bit further on north. I saw the, the climb establishing. Uh, and you can actually see from Pete Dolwood's track, Pete Dolwood actually was out front searching and then catches it first and everybody piles on Pete Dolwood. So that's that guy. Pete is blue. Um, I'm messing about. I've come to it late. So thermals have a time period that they're alive for. And... Right on cue. Right on cue, we have got a thermal developing here. You can see how it gets thinner and thinner and thinner and it bites off. So it's quite possible that you've got people climbing strongly 100 or so metres above you and you will never get to them. You've got to wait for that next cycle to come again because suddenly you're in 
this is a bit weak. And then it's, oh, this is all a bit disordered. I'm not interested in this, go back to the hill. Uh, and that's the reason. Those thermals, you know, from the source, they separate, they leave, and you've got to wait for that next cycle. Leave that there as, as entertainment. <laughs> Right, so I'm going to concentrate on these three because there was a couple of points along this slide where I made a mistake. And this is how I analyze it, where I think, okay, I think I made a mistake there. I remember at one point, we were all at the same height. I was feeling pretty good. I was in company of some good pilots. I thought, I just hang with these guys and I'm bound, bound to get places, you know? So I was intentionally hanging back a little bit. So it was peace, by the way. All the others were up here. Both myself and Pete were hanging back a little bit. Um, Pete is far more established as an XC pilot than I am. But I thought I'll just hang back, maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds behind Pete to see what they're doing and just aim myself at the person who's going up. That made sense. Right? And it worked so far until I get to this point. I'm green. And I do remember at one point, for some reason, everybody else went up and I didn't. And I got very despondent then. I got very depressed because I thought, that's it. I've lost them now. Game is over. I'm going to be on the ground soon. Um, the terrain here is exaggerated, so it looks like I'm quite high, but, uh, in reality, not as high. So if we scoot forward to this point, I'll show you where I think I made a mistake. This is this area. Yeah, so this is, yeah, I can show it to you. If we go up a little bit, there's wind bank, Upton Pike, and this is Great Wernside. That is what Coverdale is it? Coming up. Right. And we're heading off down this side of Coverdale, this high ground here. That's where people are heading from. And it was this point here that myself and Pete Darwood went on forward. And all of the others, including Alex, for instance, who did very well that day, decided to go north. And the reason was they were trying to get around the airspace. So they were making that move early to get around that crux of airspace. Whereas I found I was felt a bit low at this stage and I didn't feel I had the height to make this crossing. So I said, I just have to keep going straight. Um, and I didn't manage to find a climb here just over Penn Hill. That didn't get me very far because I landed just here. So, so uh, let's go back to this homework, from the From the early uh, part of the flight, what were the kind of things that you were drawing in? Most people took off at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. There was no major difference. I saw more similarities, similarities and differences, I think. Mean. Um, height and the left is fairly similar. Yeah. Um, we're, all so in, so we're all in the guidance. Yeah. We're all in the same guidance, so we were all going to be more or less the same. Yeah. Um, and based on the day, but this was not great. It was three, five, three, six. Yeah. It, it was not a great, not a classic. Mm. But then a block went and you explained why. Oh, right. A few, a few went north and a few went further. Yeah. And the ones who went north, they went left. That was very much a strategic decision, which I find when I'm flying, I'm just trying to stay in the air. So I don't have the bandwidth to make strategic decisions. Like, why would I leave the high ground to cross the valley to get over there? Because maybe in an hour's time, it'll make it easier to get around some airspace. I'm going, no. I'm standing on the high ground here because I'm up high. No I'll deal with that when I get to it. You know? no Otherwise, I mean, everybody was saying that they explained why they were making that um, move. I just didn't feel high enough to go with them. So I thought, oh, I'm, I'm stuck. I can't make, I can't take that decision. So, so I just. That's, that's a lock on from where you didn't get the climb. Yeah, I'm going to show it to you here now. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, so here's an interesting struggle I always have in my head because it, you know I'm just wired to be uh, conservative you know I, I've got some hype I don't necessarily want to go and make a, a rash decision and, and, and sort of spoil the position I'm already in but balance that with the fact that the place where you are is very temporary anyway uh, so to have that that sort of 
thought process where you can leave what looks like a good position, you know, with a rational uh, explanation as to why you should leave. I need to leave for navigational reasons and because the place I've chosen to go <coughs> is a likely place to give me some, some next level. That's that's a, an interesting sort of struggle, uh, and it's uh, I have to say one one that, that Jake uh, um, and uh, Alex are, are perhaps better at uh, is that okay, let's turn ninety degrees because, and we'll see later in this flight. Uh, you know, I, I was in um, an interesting situation for a while. <laughs> okay. This is the point where I lost height for some reason. We're all, uh, and we're looking at it pr pretty much straight on. So this is a little bit of height. I'm slightly lower than everybody else, but it's, it's irrelevant, you know. We're all bumping along here. And up above me, this is me at the bottom. Up above me is Pete Darwood and Chris um, Fountain. And they start to climb. All right, we must move forward. You felt at the time they were in striking distance. We're striking distance. We're we're practically the same point in the sky at the same time, right? I mean, they were there. I could see them. They were just above my head. Mm. Now, what mistake did I make? Hold on, let me speed that up for you. No. Look at the slope of that climb. Where do you think that thermal? I'm down here, right? Yeah. I should have turned back. I should have turned back to here and tried to pick it up. When I saw them climbing above my head, had I been aware of how the thermals were sloping <clears> that day? Instead, what I did is I started turning underneath them, yeah. going nowhere. Okay, what I really should have done yeah. is turned around and go back to here and try to pick that climb up and then follow them up the tube. But I didn't. They were turning, so I go, I'm turning, but I'm not going up. That's so unfair. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because it's so obvious when I look at it. We're looking at it now side on. I'm just therm thermaling actually in the bad ear underneath the thermal. And it's no wonder. And they go up and I go down there. Now, this felt significant to me. This there, I just got so depressed at this point. I thought, that's it. Because now I was on my own. Everybody was up there, not just me. I was the only one down there. I was going, oh, here we go. And I bummed along, down along the ridge, getting lower and lower, thinking, that's it. And I could see the guys above me getting even more times. I'm like, that is so unfair. <laughs> and it's because I, I just didn't make the right decision. Then. I should have turned back, searched a little bit back there. And if it didn't work, I didn't really lose much. You know? But it's because I didn't read the slope of them. So that was, that was a mistake. I was lucky. I bumbled into this thermal here and we ended up back in the same place. But it had really affected my mind. <laughs> I thought, that's it. I'm, I'm never going to make anything out of this day. As but you can see. You know, this is an interesting observation. And now we're all there. two different thermals, yet they're a K apart. Mm. I mean, how, how much of the air it's going up at any one time. Depends on the day. But also, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, but a, a, sort of an interesting side note, I kind of wrote myself a little program that makes an imaginary world. Uh, and it makes an imaginary world where you've got a little dot in Tron space, uh, and that dot can, can find a climb, and goes on a climb, and then it goes on a climb, uh, and random climbs can be, uh, can be generated. And if you want that to go, that little dot to go 30 kilometers, 50 or, or 100 kilometers, um, then one of the ways to tweak it is uh, is to alter the, the diameter of thermals and you know what area is going, in, but also the number of thermals. Uh, so we're talking about one in twenty to one in fifty 
bits of area is going up at any one time. Mm. So that it's a it's a reasonable amount. Is that more vertical as well? <laughs> no, it's possibly more vertical, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, what's the rule that I think I needed to apply here? Which is, very simple rule. If somebody is going up around you, close to you, go and try the thermal. Don't leave until you've given it a good look. Because the thing about thermaling is it's all a percentage game. Right, nobody can see thermals. Right, so if you can go to an area of the sky you know there's a thermal in, as opposed to an area you're not sure, you have a better chance of finding the thermal in the area you know. And if somebody is going up like this, and literally we were, we we're only meters apart, we weren't that far apart at all, 10, 15, 20 meters. I knew these guys were going up, I knew there was a thermal there. But what did I do? I kept going. What I should have done is stopped and said, I need to find that thermal and give it. You know, give it a certain amount of time. Now, it's very possible that they picked it up at the very bottom of the bubble, in which case, maybe I wouldn't have picked it up. But the point is, I didn't try. And that was a mistake. And it's a very simple rule. If, if there's a thermal, if you know where there's a thermal, go and look for it. If you don't, okay, use some other rules to give you a chance to find the one. Here, I knew there's a thermal there, but I didn't go looking for it. Or I looked badly for it. I should have searched more. <laughs> okay, so the other thing that I found interesting, and if you if you analyze enough tracks, you will find that it's not always the person who says highest that gets first. In fact, there's a really classic track where there's um, um, Nick Payne and Pete Darwood fly from weather. It could be weather. Yeah, so we, another one. Another one actually that I found interesting because I made a bad mistake and ended on the ground early. This is the one that you nearly got to post you. That was a really good day. Pete Darwood and Nick Payne pretty much flew all the way to the North York coast. Nick Payne was significantly lower than Pete for most of the flight. They got to the North York coast, and you can see them on the track. The two of them are together. They're flying together. They get to exactly the same point in the sky together. I mean, Pete was probably only seconds behind him. Nick Payne goes up and Pete goes down. Now that was just luck. What happened is Nick, because they were so close together in the sky at the same time, and both of them obviously are very proficient because they've got that far already, so they're well able to fly. It's not that they're going to make that mistake. That was very much a look at the timing. Nick just happened to catch the tail end of a thermal that got him just a little bit higher. Pete missed it. Right. So there is luck involved, but everybody has luck. The good pilots just put themselves in a position to be lucky all the time, consistently. Uh, and that's one of the simple rules. If there's a terminal, if you know where there's a terminal, look for it before you leave. <laughs> it's a simple rule. Why I didn't, I don't know. As it turned out, I was lucky. Um, I just went down the hill because I had nowhere else to go. And I ran into a terminal, but there was no great strategy there. I just headed off down the hill. Um, okay, so but if, importantly, down the ridge. Down the ridge, okay. yeah. Yeah. I stayed to the high point of the ridge because that's a simple rule. Stay to the high ground. If, if you don't have anything else to do, stick to the high ground. So then it gets interesting here. At this point. Did you say stick to the high ground? So you still carried on using high ground. Land, land on the top and then you'll stop again and you can follow the ridge, the, the valley down. I don't know. The, I don't know. Uh, yeah, don't know. So at <coughs> that particular high ground, um, it is actually, uh, well, you, you can see here on, on the 3D map, uh, I'm looking at, at this part here. On the way to Penn Hill, if you're getting that low, um, it's probably worth hanging on and staying as long on the top as you possibly can. Because either way, if you're going to cross onto <coughs> a flank here or cross onto a flank there, 
there's, there's a hell of a lot of, uh, of suppressed <laughs> going, you know, going down the sides here. Very little chance. Center of the valley, not in the middle of the afternoon. Getting to these flanks here would take a tremendous amount of height, height that you know you haven't got. What you have got on the top here, working for you, is it's it's dark. Okay, <coughs> so as soon as you, I mean, it's not just on the map; it's dark. This stuff is dark brown. It's covered in water, but at least that header that's sticking up, that header that's sticking up, it's in the sun, wind blown, it's dry, so it's getting hot. The soggy ground. Worry about that later. Worry about that when you need to walk through it. <laughs> but, but, even as you're going over this, there's ribbles. There's a little high point, and then it comes down again. And each one of those is going to act as a trigger. So, for that, for that particular situation, Stay on the high ground because there is enough of a set of triggers on the high ground to, to at least try and work in your favour. It has for me in, in the past. Uh, I've, I've had some, uh, some good effects from, from this particular set of unevenness in 2020. But if you're established in height, it's fine with the clouds rather than. Um, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. But uh, so I was thinking all the same thing when you've got a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. What's the new strategy? There's a good point, actually. It doesn't take because this is up at 2,000 feet, mm -hmm. 1,600 feet. <laughs> 3,600 feet there. So that, you know, that's for me what, what you would do in Dallas. If uh, I was looking at the North York Moors. Now they tend to be way more even and flat on the top, with no obvious trigger points. Uh, and previously, so on that that flight, Joe, you were you were nearly coastal uh, flight. Um, I was over the North York Moors. Uh, and heading for the Billsdale Mass and, and bin, bin it uh, because I thought, you know, I'm, I, I haven't got the clouds for this. The ground's not really telling me anything. And I actually went back to the edge of the North York Moors to go and take to go and take the climb because I had the landscape there. I didn't feel as though I had enough to work with on black tops. So let me show you a little bit how the guys gaggle fly. So this here is Chris Fountain. Um, at this point, I remember over the radio, the guys said, I think we should head across the valley and try. They were already planning to get around the airspace, which is up here. I don't want to put the airspace on this because it slows it all down, but I can show you in a minute. So at this point, they, I remember they, they got a lift, they got to here, and then the talk was, let's head across the valley. Now, both myself and Pete had missed that piece of lift. I definitely had missed it. I'm down here. Um, the elevation is exaggerated. I'm on what they call, if you look at Google Earth and you go to here, you can put uh, elevation exaggeration. So it just makes all the mountains higher. It makes the contrast easier to see, so you can see that. Thing. I'm a lot lower to the ground here than it appears in this screen. So when they were saying on the radio, let's go across, at this point, I certainly didn't feel capable of make that crossing. It's too big a crossing. So I was kind of forced just to carry on down the end the, the spine. And at this point, I thought I was just going to land because I really felt I was about to land here on top of that. Anyway. Right. But I got a lift. So to show you the gaggling, watch how closely these guys slide together. If I pull in uh, Jake, right. and if I pull in Alex, They fly together really well. Yeah. And it's no wonder that they, they do really well. They're just, they're very good at communicating and flying together. You can see these, these three tracks. You know, they're pretty much following themselves. 
So, but I'll take those out because they're not useful here. Uh, take check out. Right. So at that point. Isn't the point of the the well, they are spread out. Um, so, you know, they're spread out in various places. They're spread out there. I mean, there's good 100 meters, 150, 200 meters between them there. Okay. You know, that's, that's quite a bit. Here's a good rule of thumb. A glider at 200 meters away, cover it with your thumb. The wing. Wing and, and pilot. Oh, that's ten, 10 meters, um, I think it's about <coughs> two degrees of your field of vision. At 200 meters away, you'll pretty much cover the glider. And um, that 100 to 200 meter range, uh, you will probably capture a thermal, even if that thermal, I mean, the, the rising column of air in the thermal is 50 to 100 meters in diameter. But you can pick up the, the stuff that's going on around it. So if you're 150 meters separation between you, uh, and you've got the sense to go in a line of three, your search area is vast. Compared to a single glider, uh, it makes a, a hell of a lot of difference. But like I say, I, I wrote this, this uh, program, this kind of virtual world. Uh, you can actually set two or three gliders on, and they'll go and find somebody, and then get to the top, go on and climb. Um, if I tune it so that you've got thermals occurring randomly, they get a pilot on their own to go 30, 40 kilometers on average, because I can run this hundreds of times. Then a group of three pilots with the same amount of random thermals occurring never goes down for the rest of the day. They just It's that much difference in altering the chances. So I'm going to show you this point here. At this point, the other guys have, have got up high and they've headed across the valley. So I've taken them out of that thing. This is Pete Darwood in blue and this is me in green. I wasn't aware of Pete Darwood was just above my head here. I thought he had gone up to the valley. Really. I, I just wasn't aware. And I was getting very depressed because now I've missed the second thermal that everybody's gone up in and they're going up. So I now miss the chance to gaggle with guys that are, are really good Texas. So I was getting really depressed at this point, you know, I thought. Yeah. I wasn't aware that Pete was above me. So had I been a bit more aware, I would have realized that he was climbing. Right? And what do you do when he's climbing? You go and find the thermal. In other words, why didn't I turn back? Look at it again, look at the line of that thermal. It might well have been down here had I turned back. Might not have been. Maybe I flew straight through it and it wasn't there. Maybe he was just picking up the bottom of it. But I was very low here. I just wasn't aware that he was there and climbing above me. I thought it was on my own. And literally, I could throw a stone at him. But this is the same time. We were both the same time. Same time. So lack of awareness. It's, it's not difficult to look. But I know in my mindset at that stage, I was getting pretty dark, pretty annoyed. So we Is wandered out. <coughs> comfortable uh, with the radio in climbing? No. Can you say comfortable? Yeah. If you don't, so I don't know, maybe he did, but you call out the climb. Mm. He may not, he may not have said I'm climbing here. He probably could see me because he was above me, so he can definitely see below. He may not have said, Look, Dave, I'm climbing here. You know, maybe he'll turn around. Um, but call, call out the climb. Okay. So I missed a second opportunity there, and I was very, very low. I got to the very end of Penn Hill here at this point. And then I picked, I remember scratching around here. I could feel something. I was on my last gasp. And that's why I started doing all this wibbly wobbling because I knew there was something there, something. And I said, no, I can't let this go. Mm -hmm. So I searched and searched and searched. And yeah, luckily enough, I found something and I started climbing up again. Now at this stage, I don't know where Pete is. He's not that far away, but I don't know where he is. Right? And in fact, 
we're right up at the same point again. <laughs> but I wasn't aware that Pete was there. I should have been. Had I been aware. And then I start. I, I find a climb. And I go, yeah, I'm feeling really positive now again. I'm up at, I'm up at the cloud here. I'm actually, I remember I'm circling in the wispies underneath the cloud. And I could see Pete below me. And it looks like he's very close there. But I remember looking down and going, whoa, he's a long way down there. I thought he was way, way down the ground. He's not. Look at how close he is to me. And let me see what the distance is. I'm at um, 1,280 meters. What's he at? 1209, 80 meters. It was only 80 meters below me. But I remember looking down going, wow, that's a long way down there. He's in trouble. <laughs> I'm here and I'm, I'm riding the whiskey. He's up underneath the cloud. I'm, in, I'm, I'm laughing. He's in trouble. So, I mean, 80 meters away, that, that wider is sort of three, four fingers. That's, yeah. It's quite a long way away, actually, isn't it? Yeah. But it's 80 meters. That's eight, eight seconds away. Yeah. And seeing that both of us were at 1200 meters, I mean, he was very close to me. So, the obvious thing to do there, wait, he's climbing. I'm underneath the clouds, but I got a little bit panicked at that point. I do remember I was underneath the cloud, right on the edge of the cloud, floating around. There was a big blue crossing here. And I could feel myself about to start to drop. I felt, okay, I'm at the very top of this lift and I'm about to lose a little bit of height. I panicked. I should have waited for Pete. And he was under me on the radio. We were talking to each other. And I didn't wait. I headed off across. And it was a big blue crossing, and I just didn't, I didn't manage it. So if you looked at here, I did all right till I got about halfway across the valley, and then I sunk right down. Um, it looks like I'm quite high over them. Uh, the more there, but I wasn't. Again, this is elevation exaggeration. So I, I felt I was really, really close. So I decided to push forward to this ridge in the hope that I could maybe ridge sword and pick up the thermal. But I landed. Pete, on the other hand, interestingly enough, and I've been trying to ring him today to ask him. Wait, you see. Look, both of us are here. Why did he take a 90 degree turn there? Why? Now, the reason he, he did it is to get around the uh, airspace. Let me show you the airspace. Right. So, stop. Where's the mouse? So he decided at that point, he didn't know where I was, although it looks like we were very close together. At that stage, I had gone on ahead. He said he couldn't see me at that stage, even though he probably heard me going, damn it, I'm going down. And he decided he was going to go around to the south of that airspace. Now, that's quite a significant crosswind. So oh, I'd love to know why he did that. What did he see? To go 90 degrees to the right down a valley, whereas I was heading straight across to an obvious ridge that was into wind. Was he getting any rift on that transition, or was it just in dead air or sinking? Um, looking at his pretty much, yeah, yeah. But at the same time, he did better than I did. He got. No, so although he never got back up high again, he did manage to get around the airspace and give himself chances. Now he landed over here. Because if you go to the west and the wind's strong, there's a danger of getting drifted into yeah. the Yeah. So that is interesting decision point that's definitely worth asking Pete. I just haven't been able to get in touch with him today. Um, he'd probably remember that because we've talked about this point before. I just don't remember. Why did he turn right there? still very close to kind of, he hadn't seen you sinking out at all. No. I'm going to go around he knew I was above his head, and he asked me why I didn't wait for him when, when we eventually did the retrieve. I think you retrieved us, Joe. Um, and that was pure panic on my stage. You know, I, I felt I'd got to the clouds. I absolutely didn't want to lose any height then, and I headed. Whereas, really, I shouldn't wait. You know, two, two miles better than one, especially Pete, who's a much better XC pilot than me. I could have piggybacked off his experience, uh, but I didn't. He didn't. He didn't know where I was when he decided to go. It looks like we're quite close there. We we'll move a bit forward. He made a conscious effort to go to the north airspace. Yes, I knew the airspace was there, and I felt this was less of a crosswind journey than trying to get around to the south. Plus, there's a ridge here, big long ridge here. So I thought that's got to work. Even though I remember this was a huge, big blue hole, 
and there were clouds way over here at the end of the moor. One thing that would be the bit uncertain about is even sort of outside of the airspace bit, it's also MOD kind of ground. Yep. And if you kind of go down in there, it's probably not going to be that happy. So. Well, see this here? Yeah, that's Catrick, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was active on that game. Yeah. 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 There's planes with guns and stuff. Yeah, they yeah. yeah. actually were doing tank maneuvers. Yeah. As Pete was gliding over here low on his final death glide, he said, I was flying over these tanks <laughs> doing maneuvers in Catherine. And yeah. it was for a long time, so I'm not sure I'm going to clear the fence. <laughs> That's always making me nervous now. Yeah. But going around this side. Yeah. yeah. Both sides. Both, yeah. both sides of it. It's like moving around. So if we throw in Jake Herbert there, we'll see why they decided to make this little move away back here. You see, yeah. it's, it's taking yeah. this all the way out of it. How would you have waited if you were uh, if you were near, just in this the cloud? The danger just, of going into, into cloud. Why don't you fly out? Fly out the cloud and fly back in again. Just in and out, in and out. Yeah. So fly out, drop a little, come back in and, and come up again. Uh, yes. It wasn't strong. The, the lift wasn't strong. There was no danger it was going to get hoovered up into anything. None of the clouds were big back there. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been any problem to wait. None at yes. all. Just but it just never right even crossed my mind. My mind was like, oh, I'm high. Go now before you lose it. That was my mindset. But well, that's stupid, you know? Um, it's always been equal. Uh, if you got to the top of the climb and, and you've got wispy clouds there, and it's, it's still growing, you've got 20 minutes. So let me, let me show you I mean, something else. It's not a bad cross-country strategy on a windy day in itself. It's, it's, it's just to the cloud. <laughs> so, I'm going to show you Pete Logan. I would say the cloud grows over 20 minutes. Uh, now, you read the, the books like uh, Book by Martin's uh, Thermal Flying. And that's, that's where UK cross-country flying differs a lot from, from anywhere further south and in latitude. And it's because we are so close to the sea most of the time. Uh, and it's because our base is lower and we've got higher relative humidities but once a cloud is, is grown, well, sometimes it can just stay there all afternoon. If, if there's no particular force of sink, if it's not being blown over some, some bit of landscape and, and therefore forcing the air to go down. Case, case in point, uh, the, uh, the cloud that was over Penny Yent uh, is Saturday uh, that I flew through had been there two hours. I mean, I went into it hoping to it was some lift, but it looked bloody dead. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, you know, the, the whole lore about a cloud only lasting 20 minutes, that's high altitude, you know, sort of 7,000 foot base in the Alps or in the US. Uh, and it's in it's in drier air where those clouds actually uh, do start to evaporate. That condensed water droplet starts to evaporate, which will be, and I mean the sun's strong in that. So um, I'll show you a couple of more points that I took from this flight. And again, the only reason I'm looking at this is because I flew the, the green track, so it makes it much easier for me to remember. Okay. This is Pete Logan. He eventually got his act together. You can see he's quite, quite a ways behind everybody. Like I'm already at the end and making the crossing from Penn Hill across to, I don't know what the name of this is. Um, Pete is way back here. So I do remember as I was landing, I remember a wing going over my head. It was Pete. Right? Sure so, way. yeah, yeah. No. I hope you Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it. Now, what's interesting here is if you look at it, I set myself up textbook for that crossing. I got height just above Penn Hill before I'm doing the big traverse, right? What does Pete do? <laughs> he's actually on the way down as he starts to cross. The difference, 
And also keep in mind another thing. Peter's flying a C and I'm flying a B. There's very little difference in the glide angle there. The B's and C's, there isn't really that much downwind. It's, it's insignificant, the glide angles. So even if I was flying a C, I probably wouldn't have got anywhere else because I'd still have gone down around about that glide angle. The biggest difference is halfway across, so if you look at it here, halfway across the valley, Pete picked up a tiny little climb and it was just enough to get him over onto halfway over the moor. There were clouds at the back of the moor and they were obviously triggering along that line. As you can see, they were triggering roughly, I thought they were triggering off the front of the moor. I think they were triggering just behind here and I just didn't have the height. So there's an element of luck in it. It's also possible that had I been more astute and had I waited, I might have seen something on the crossing, some whiskey somewhere. I might have been able to just have a slightly more nifty line crossing. But at the, remember, at the time, I remember, I'm at cloud base. I'm going, oh, damn it. I don't want to lose this height without doing something big. I'm just going straight. That was it. It was normally the strategy and the decision other than just go straight, flash down. So, and the B and C, you're off by the unit seven, yeah, six point one aspect ratio, isn't it? Mm. And he's flying the Cayenne, it's a six point four, yeah, not much in it. No, I, I am curious. The B and C thing, I think, is maybe the wrong thing, it would be more interesting to see aspect ratio, aspect ratios, yeah, because you, mm -hmm. you want a medium seven, yeah, aggressively using bar, mm -hmm. probably quite similar to a Cayenne trim. You know, then then compared to something like you know the low beams, the five point ones and stuff. I suspect the low beam versus a high beam maybe you'll we'll see the difference. So then one last thing is that's Ed. Don't take Pete Logan out because I want to show Ed followed a similar line to Pete Darwin. But uh, Ed was a long way behind. And again, this is Ed way back. He's still Baffing around the wind bank and Pete is almost at the end of his life. <laughs> All right. So this is what time what time of the day is this? That's an hour out. So I think that's about 12, uh, 10, about 11 o'clock. That doesn't sound right, does it? Oh, that's start time. It's the it's about 12 o'clock. It's about noon. Pete is away over here. Ed is probably just setting up. The interesting thing is Ed and Pete took a similar track around the south of uh, airspace. And there isn't a huge difference in what happened. And, you know, it could be that Ed flew the day when it was better. He's not getting much more height than Pete did. He's not getting any more height than Pete did on this part. A little bit more consistent. It was just here. Pete didn't get anything. And Ed picked up a climb. And it could be because Ed was flying a little bit later in the day. The day was working better over there. Right. So, again, just because you're left behind, you might find, and Ed was, Ed and Alex both obviously made 100k. Ed went further than anyone else that day, right? Even though he left, what, an hour or two hours behind him. So just because you're left behind doesn't mean you can't get further than everybody else or, or same year. Ed was on his top, wasn't he? And Ed was on his top as well, mm -hmm. yeah. I guess he so, wouldn't have run out of land anyway, probably before he went out of sun. Well, Ed ran out of land. Yeah. Well, so the, I mean, there's other limiting factors. The, obviously, the afternoon builds. Uh, nice. That's, that's close. <laughs> yeah. No, he, he, you know, he, he must have made a decision because he could have kept going there if he wanted to. I'm guessing he made a decision. Maybe there's um, yeah. a might be a train station or something there. Yeah. You know, so he may have decided so there's no reason why he took that left. But but also the sea breeze he started to build, particularly from the northeast coast of you know, later on in the afternoon, it will be you know really quite strong in that position. So my analysis of that from my own flight is I've learned a lesson for myself. If I know there's a climb around me, go looking for it. don't go somewhere else where you don't know there's a climb. Go to the place of the sky where you know there's a climb, you have a better chance of finding it. And had I done that, there were two climbs I missed that I may not have got. It may not have made any difference to the, the day, but at least I would have been in a much more positive frame of mind um, flying because I wouldn't have felt I lost opportunity, I felt I was doing well.
you know, through the giving you that positivity, which breeds success. But negativity breeds the ground. So, <laughs> ground so, so. Um, so that's what I do. I go through all of my fights like that, and I find other people's fights in the same day. And I go through them step by step. And I look for those points where there was a difference of something changed, something was different. Just trying to figure out what did I do wrong? And then what's the rule I can learn? The rule is very simple from those. If there's a term, if you know there's a term somewhere, go and look there. Go and look for it somewhere else. That's, that's not where it is. That's a simple rule. Do we have a beer and buy break? Right? Oh, yeah. All oh, right. Okay. So this, um, so this is the Excel file where it has every single IGC file on XCD going back, and it goes back to about 2003. But just um, to sort of compare like for like, I've only compared five or flights from the five main sites, uh, Bs and Cs, and for all the years from 2016 to 2021. I haven't gone back any further than that, even though I can, but I said, right, that's the data set we're, we're using. And I wanted to see what the data told us. So the one that I found particularly interesting was this one over here. I also broke, uh, in order to have distance bands, I broke the distance people flew up to 10K, from 10 to 25K, from 25 to 50, 50 to 75, and 75 to 200. I'm not bothering anything above 100. So the four distance bands, 25, 50, 75, 200. So that's how I split it. And that's straight line distance, not turn point distance. So um, by, by excluding the 10K, excludes all the triangles. So I didn't want to put triangles in this analysis as well, because triangles bring into into wind um, legs and stuff. And it would definitely skew the advantages between Bs and Cs to down numbers. So that's why I'm only looking at this from 10 to 25. Because <clears throat> triangles generally get back to very close to where you start. So your straight line distance starts and finishes less than 10k. So some interesting stats. Pilot smack can't class per month. So uh, you'll find that C is generally orange and B is blue. This is just the number of pilots and the number of flights. So this is saying that in the month of um, April, there are 20 B pilots who have registered XC flights in the last five years. And they have flown 40 flights. The 20 pilots are flights, roughly two flights high. Um, in April. Whereas you can see the C, there's a lot less C pilots, but again, it's roughly two flights high. So in other words, B pilots and C pilots actually find the same number of flights each. And that's pretty much average. You can see that there's a slight difference in June, but Generally, that there isn't a big advantage yet down here in November but, or in September, but the numbers are too low there to make any observation pattern. Really, there's only two or three flights, so it's not enough. But you can see just on the number of flights people make, B e pilots pretty much fly as much C. Number of flights. This is the number of hours people stay in the air. So you can, you can definitely see that the C pilots tend to stay longer in the air. This is the average and this is the max. The maximums aren't hugely different except here in um, July. But the averages are higher. So that would suggest to me, keep in mind that there's less C pilots than there are B pilots. C pilots are more consistent. Makes sense. C pilots are generally um, just to be around longer, which is better. So that kind of tells you that, uh, again, I don't think it's the wing that's, that's making them stay in the air longer. I think it's just for better pilots. The one that I found very interesting was down here. Where is it? Yeah, this one here. This is the one that I thought was interesting. And this is the one I put up on the, um, this one here. 
Yep. Yeah. So what I put on the WhatsApp group, let's pull that over there. Uh, sugar. It's disappeared. Let's pull that. Yeah, let's pull it over there. And if I just look at weather file. German. Oh, your PC is a little bit slow. Okay, so this is weather felt, and this is just to get an idea of these are your distance bands, the number of flights, 25 uh, K or less for B pilots and C pilots. B pilots are actually doing well now. There's more B pilots flying 25K than C pilots, right? 50, more or less the same. 75, more or less the same. 100, <laughs> interestingly enough, there's more B pilots than that. <laughs> but I think it's just because you're, you're down to like two flights. There was one C flight and two B flights. You can't derive a pattern from that. But in weather, what it's showing you is there isn't a huge drop off of B pilots as you move up the distance bands. They're kind of similar. If you go to wind bank, Ah, there you go. There is quite a significant lack of B pilots here. They, they do really well. Look, they do really, really well up to 50. And all of a sudden, they don't do so well after that. And I don't think you can do uh, take much notice of this because there's so few flights. Take for slowing yeah. Possibly. It possibly. Is, yeah. is it? Oh, okay, right. So, and, and this, I was looking at this pattern because all of the other um, sites, if you look at all the other sites, there isn't such an obvious advantage to seas on one of the distance bands. Here, the data seems to suggest that wind bank, the sea pilots just do significantly better when you're going from the 50 to 75. Yeah. I think it's to do with that airspace um, we were looking at earlier. I think it's just tricky airspace to get around. Let's be pilots on the ground. Um, and that's an experience thing. Uh, Thanks, summer water. <clears throat> Again, the numbers are too low here to really draw any conclusions, but you can see that bees hold their own up to 50K pretty much across the board. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's kind of tells me that I don't need to go up a wing class to be able to fly further. Because- and Rosie was just showing something yeah. on the bee. Yeah. Then it's called for a gap to the coast that day that I was showing you that. I don't know why James actually didn't show up on that. He must have submitted the track. So, um, yeah, that's that's what I was mostly looking for in the data. You know, what is the advantage that a C has over a B? And the answer is very little if you're going down wind. You know, the real advantage is the pilot that's under the wind. Um, the ones that make better decisions go further. Doesn't matter what wind they fly. Like, you make a bad, bad decision, and guaranteed you could be flying the hottest wing in the world. You would be on the ground and all that. You make good decisions on a low B, you go a lot further, even an A. So uh, there's a lot more, uh, and I we can make this uh, this worksheet. There's a load, a lot more information here. It's very interesting. If you want to go through them, the graphs on a PC that's not this slow. So there's another one. If, if, if I do all of these. I think it's all crypto processing that's happening on it now. I put Tom's USB stick in there. Uh -huh. <laughs> Stags, <laughs> summer. Yeah. Come on. Let's go back to weather and bank. And finally, Dodd. Up there. Uh, right, so those are the five main sites. Yeah. So this gives you an idea of who's flying the most. And Dave Smart, Pete Logan, Jake Herbert, Pete Darwood blows everybody out of the water. Which is 
he just flies a lot. And this is airtime. This is just out in the you know. You can see that, and all of the people who go far fly a lot. I mean, that graph is just telling you you want to get good at XC. Fly more. And if you have the opportunity to fly more, you have a better chance of improving. But that's just like any sport. The more you practice at a sport, the better you get. Now, some people will, will improve faster than others by their natural ability. But the more you get to fly, the better you get. If you start to fly smart, in other words, every time you go out, you have something in your mind that you want to improve or you want to try or experiment with, you learn even faster. So, for instance, one thing I discovered was my thermal uh, diameters are too wide. I discovered that about two years ago when I started comparing my thermal diameters to other people flying the day. I was consistently a little bit wider. So I devised a mechanism on my deck. Whereas when I'm terminating, I can look at it and you can tell me if I'm more than 16 second terminal or not. And I can tighten it. And it forces me to tighten my thermals. And interestingly enough, I terminal better now. What I've, what I've noticed is by following this, I get higher in the stack than I used to. I used to get like halfway up the stack now, I might get two thirds away at the stack. So what is it you've done in the deck? It's a terminal market. Terminal system. Okay. But it's tiny. All I see is a tiny little circle. It's not so much to mark the thermal, it's to force me to turn so I remain inside the circle. Does that force me to have quite a tight, tight circle? And I, I watch it all the time as I'm terminating, you know. And hopefully over time, I just naturally get a tighter terminal circle. And it has improved my thermal. Um, so you'll do the circle in uh, maybe 25 seconds, and maybe I've got it down now to 18 seconds. General on average. Now it's, it's just a rule of thumb. It was obvious sometimes when it's better to do wider ones, but as a rule of thumb. So that was just born out of analyzing my flights. What does the data tell me? And then how can I find something to force me to thermal tighter? And I found just a thermal marker on XC track works really well. That circle that it has on the thing is about 16 seconds, 16 seconds. And I'd say that is. Not by choice. I don't think that's random. I think they probably picked that mm -hmm. diameter of a thermal marker for that. You know? at, at the bottom of the thermal, it's much narrower and it gets wider. Generally. So, are you talking about doing fewer seconds when you're initiating, when you're joining the bottom of the thermal? Too complex. For the Too complex. Mm -hmm. for, for where I am at the moment. That thought process is too complex. So my thought process is, I hit a thermal, where's my marker? Stay inside the circle, all the way up. It doesn't guarantee the maximum climb in that thermal, but it does guarantee consistency. Whereas if I start to think, oh, I'm at the bottom, I should be tighter on the bottom. No, I'm a little bit higher, I should loosen it a bit. What I'll happen, what, I, what I'll end up doing is just confusing myself. When all I want is to keep it simple. So for me, right now, and that's just me. That's just a decision I've made based on the analysis of my flights. You know, maybe different for you, Chris. You have to decide. But if you don't have a if you don't have a, a marker that you're trying to meet, then you can't land and go right. This time I kept my thermos to sixteen seconds each. Did it improve or not? Was it better or worse? Because if it was better, I go good. I've learned something. And if it was worse, good. I've learned something. You know. But if it's just randomly turning in thermals, however you feel fit, when you land, you won't know whether you were actually doing something better or worse than the last time you did, because it is all random. So you need to pick something that you can measure your performance against, if you want to improve. Uh, is there other stuff interesting? Sixteen seconds is it's like, generally. It's quite tight when you, you know, when you try and put it in action in the sky. So this, this is an interesting one. You know, it's um, that's an ideal. It's a it's a rare day that Britain gives you thermals that are round enough for that. Mm. Uh, quite often, uh, thermals can be really quite excellent. <clears throat> And uh, the difficulty in centering them, it, you know, you always think oh, there's a center here somewhere. Sometimes there isn't, um, and you just have to live with the asymmetry 
I mean, I, I, last year at the North South Cup, I went through a sheet. I'm pretty sure it was a sheet because I, I was coming around, sinking, would shoot up uh, at maybe four metres a second, come out of it, and then 180 degrees later, shoot up at four metres a second again. Um, and that was quite consistent for uh, six or seven turns. <laughs> but, it, you know, the, the, the 16 second average, once you've, uh, you know, once you've got somewhere near the centre, means that within that 16 seconds, you're never travelling too far from the centre. So your, your correction always has to be smaller than if you're turning in a, a 25 second thermal. I think this graph is interesting. So is it better to fly through the core? I mean, obviously you'd be better circling in the core. If you can't find that sensor, they don't seem to be able to function do. So they end up getting a bit stronger at one point and then still do that, still stay roughly in the rather than fly at the sorry, what I was trying to get to like the same like a sailplane does, they tend to fly through the middle because they can't turn tight enough. Do a nice nice circle round and go through the middle again. Mm. Is that a reasonable strategy as opposed to uh, shall we say messing it up and, and, and not finding the core and therefore spending a lot of time there? Mm. Yeah, staying the week. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say choose the difficult thing and always try to be centering it. The reason is that you will be flying with other people at the same height. And uh, quite often, and um, you know that that kind of disordered approach to to remaining in the lift doesn't work if there's other people around you. It sort of forces forces them out. Yeah, um, I, I I would say yeah. If there's a difficulty in in sort of establishing that mental image of where's the lift. Where's upwind and where's downwind in this thermal? What part am I in at the moment? Do I need to straighten and then turn tight? Tackle that head on. I also have a problem where I get very concerned with the level of drift, so especially wind map when you talk about the wall. Mm -hmm. Once I get to the wall, I start to get really sort of worried. You're then going to go cross over to the, to the lee side of the hill. Well, you have, a, you have a number now. If you're yes. at 2,000 feet, 2,500 feet, and going up, that's, that's no, probably no, the no. threshold to say, I'll keep going. If you're less, you want to start thinking coming back. And it's, it's not because that's guaranteed, but that gives you a sort of threshold. You know? Like I said, some people have left a lot lower than that. But <coughs> they're much more experienced. Yeah, yeah. When, when you're that experienced, you know the feel. And you don't have to worry about the numbers as much, but when you're not, that works. <laughs> this is interesting, this one. This is the average distance people got leaving at different hours of the day. So you can see that the best time to leave is generally 11 o'clock in the morning. You know? But it's not 11 o'clock adjusted for British summer time. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> I'm not quite okay. sure. Uh, it may not be. So that yeah. may well be noon. But interesting enough, two o'clock. Does quite well as well, you know. Doesn't quite do as well as eleven, but then again, eleven is more of the day to fly, so that's probably why you go further at eleven. You just have more of the day. Yeah, what about chances of, of success for whatever fifty k at that time? Probability of reaching fifty k. Fifty k is two hours, and uh, a, a slow tick. So you you're still flying until four, mm. and the, the peak heating of the day. In summer, is about two pm. So you think that? Yeah, it's all right, is that? Yeah. For just the fifty k flights, doesn't really matter what time of the day you leave. That's just fifty k. Yeah. So if if you're if you're a fifty k pilot, I kind of class myself as a fifty k pilot. So I think on a good day, I feel confident enough I might fly through fifty k. Might I might do forty. But that's I'm not beyond that. So 
50k. Doesn't matter what time of the day you leave, you have as much chance of making 50k leaving at 11 as you have two o'clock. In other words, you're never too late. If you look at my experience of looking at flights on XU, is that for experienced people who fly long distances, is that typically on a good day they might be taking off at like 10 30 or so, and then they might be like a almost an hour sometimes of waiting for things to start mm-hmm. working, and then they're sort of leaving the hill kind of after yeah. 11 o'clock. Yeah, so and plus, in the flying for an hour before they, yeah, yeah. So these graphs don't show that sort of spending an hour soaring mm-hmm. in before you take off. I didn't, even though I, I, I could work that out, but I haven't. Right. So oh, the grass are some pretty obvious. By month, by distance, for instance, let's go do them all again. So what month do you think people fly furthest? Yeah. Get ready, boys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, oh. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's that's flight count. Sorry, that's the number of flights. So there were that many 25k flights in June. Yeah. yeah that is my month. Yes. 25k flights. That hasn't um, reset itself. Just do 50k flights, so let's see about 50. Best month for flying 50k? April. Or maybe July, if you fly saving. <laughs> no. Best month to fly 75k. Are these results skewed because many pilots head off abroad? Oh, could well be. Could well be. Could well be. I mean, I'm I'm not making any claims that this data is nothing. One that's been like the last few years has been great early on, hasn't it? And then the middle has been absolutely pants. It can get a bit stable. Yeah. Sometimes in the middle. Um, it's, no, uh, it's no surprise that I think this is just the total distance flown. If you add up the distance for all the flights, you're going to find that the biggest number of kilometers is early in the year, fourth and fifth. You know, the way out that. So really, if, you, if you're looking for distance, spring time, but we all know that. Right? But this is just a way of making sure that the data is kind of accurate and that the graphs are showing you what you all want to be true. So, Maybe the other graphs are showing you something interesting as well. <laughs> there should there. be spring, spring is the difference of summer. You know, for, you know, I don't yeah, well, yes. So the thermals being stronger is a is a symptom of the fact that spring brings the greatest difference in heating. Yes, and then and then the best lapse rates. Whereas, you know, between sea and ground uh, and the air, there's maybe in August, because the ground's been absorbing so much heat, not so much difference between between the air, bodies of water, (coughs) and the land. So would cloud base generally be lower than August? No, it's it's all time. Conditions drier, so so we've been heating up for a little bit longer. But it's harder to get to climate. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm saying I, I don't have any information, but yeah. So I mean, on, on a good XC day, you'll be at climate. Base. It's kind of given an yeah. XC day, you should be able to get the cloud base, but the cloud base will be higher or low, depends on the day. But you know, if it's a good XC day, you have to be able to get the cloud base, whatever it might be. This one shows you roughly how long do you think you're going to be in the air. And these are averages. And you can see that pretty much two hours is a good XC from the day of the day. There are some outliers for people who go a long, long way, but the average is pretty much two hours. 
So however fast you fly, that is I2 is roughly how far you can get on average. So if you do a three hour XC5 from the X and the Dales, you're doing really well. Three hours is a really good flight. <laughs> That's the data. So I just wanted to round off with a bit more uh, on the maps and uh, and the discussion side of things. Because uh, I did my homework. But, uh, you know, I absolutely want you to, to come in uh, and argue and, and tell me what, what you folks were finding out as well. Uh, and if I can see from Zoom any questions coming in on the on the chat, uh, I will uh, try and field those as well. I don't know what my computer's doing, but it's. Uh, Certainly having a day off today, isn't it? So this is my set of rules that I decided for myself this year. One is, if I see somebody climbing close, I don't find that close. And don't leave area, look for it. And if I don't find it, look more before I leave the area. So, very simple. If I know there's a permit somewhere, go and look for it and give it a really good look. The other one, Forget about the speed of the day, forget about everything. Climb to the very top. Keep in my wing is scraping right the bottom of the cloud. Unless it's a really big cloud. Sorry. Right? In other words, take every turn to the very, very top. That doesn't guarantee you the longest flight because on some days you need to be leaving thermals, you know, maybe two thirds of the way up because you can move really fast. But that's an advanced flying technique that first it doesn't apply to me because I'm just trying to thermal and stay in the air. So I'm not trying to break records. I'm just wanting to stay in the air longer. So the longer I'm in the air, the more I can practice. The more I practice, the better I get. But that's the second rule. Take every thermal to the very top. If there's somebody above me in the thermal, don't leave it until I get to that height. Right? Or do everything I can to get to that height. In other words, get there. Second one. And, and third one is fly down the, on the high ground towards the sunshine. Not blue holes. Not blue holes. Unless you can have <laughs> towards sunshine, meaning towards sunny surfaces. Sunny surfaces. Sunny surfaces. And if you're facing yeah. into the wind, even better. Yeah. Can't but, argue with physics. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, obviously, fly the clouds. I mean, if you're up in a cloud, but you need to pick your clouds on the way up. So as I'm going up in the thermal, I want to be looking at the clouds. And by the time I get to the top, I want to know what my next step was. Then I don't want to find myself at the top. Going right now, where'd I go? <laughs> because you can't see when you're up there. You can't see the good clouds in the background. You can see a working cloud from below. Mm. You can't see a working cloud from its shadow. So if you're at the top, all you've got are, you know, there's something over there, and you might have a clear view of the top of the cloud, in which case you can see if it's alive or not. But that you can only see the next one. From below, from half height, you can see two, three clouds ahead. Mm. So you can see a street, uh, or you can see a, a large blue hole or a dead area. Uh, but from from base, you can just see the cloud shadows, uh, and it's it's a keen eye that can spot a dead cloud from a live live cloud from its shadow. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, sorry, the other one. If I'm at base and there's somebody underneath me climbing, wait for them and communicate. Don't push on ahead because you panic. Just wait. Two is much better than one. So what, what strikes you? From the next day. Oh, well, same, same area. area. No, different times. Yeah, same area. Same area, yeah. Mm. This is a wind bank, isn't it? So this is wind bank. Uh, this is this is again the same day. Fifty percent of the thermal, uh, fifty percent of people who leave wind bank is in that area there, and all the others then are spread out here and way down here. But at least fifty percent of flights leave from the Scrags. There's a particular notch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the crags behind the trees? Is it? 
This is where we take off here. So, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is, uh, I guess, Hawkswood. Yeah, yeah. It's Hawkswood. It's where you actually took off from you. Same, same off yeah. I mean, Hawks, Hawkswood itself isn't usually that bad a trigger, I think. But, mm. you know, everybody is, uh, uh, including Ed and me, you know, I think I was about half an hour, three quarters of an hour behind people. Ed was an hour or two. <clears throat> came came from here. <clears throat> we had two on that day. Uh, there was Dave uh, and uh, Tam. Yeah. You you went uh, further down. Further down. Uh, further yeah, further down the ridge. Yes. What was the blue one? So the blue one. Uh, it was Pete Dalwood. Pete Dalwood's doing a bit of exploring. Mm. Mm. It might be an hour out. I, I don't no, know. No, I think that's the right time. Yeah, it could be. So I, I can't remember. Um, <coughs> so, so that that's a sort of thing again. Finding the thermal away from site isn't that hard because usually there's lots of people flying. So you can see where, it's, where, if you're watching, you can see people leaving. Now, you may not get into the thermal, but you'll see where they left from. So it should give you an indication where to probably go from again once the cycle builds up again. It's much easier to find the first thermal than the second, of course, because first thermal, everybody's milling around looking for it. So all you should have to be is observing. Getting away from the site isn't as hard as then your second and third thermal. So you can get three thermals together and you figure something out. And I know every day is different, but the sort of time scales on a piece of thing, a day between cycles. Oh, yeah. 15, oh, 15 minutes. Trade secret. <laughs> 15 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah I, don't, I don't know. So, you know, on an inverted day in the UK, there might be two opportunities to get away from a hill. You know, on those wafty nil mm. wind, frustrating uh, days, it, mm. it could be you know an hour, two hours between the, the two opportunities you get. I think that day, the fact that everybody was away, uh, or, or a big gaggle was away early, and then people went subsequently, that says there were repeated opportunities. It's a conveyor belt. Yeah. Second part of the flight. So people have got to the top. Get your wits about you. I mean, what's did you pick up anything on your homework from from this second part of the flight? What's the second part? Got to the top of the climb. Right. So where, where are people generally over before they start their at the top of the where, where, where does the thermal tend to end? About like halfway across the valley. Half across the valley. Mm. Right. Well, yeah. So what I mean, what are people's tracks telling you here? <clears throat> that those climbs are going all the way back, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. But they're all yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Wernside is on the top right. Yeah. Uh, Wernside is over here. Yeah. Yeah. So very, very few flights that leave a uh, windbank go to Wernside. Very few. Most of them pick up a second thermal either between Wernside, you know, just in the valley there, and you're between Wernside and Buckley Pike. There's a kind of a the kicker there, you get a lot of people pick up a thermal there or over towards the Buckingham Pike side. Very few flights go to Great Warren side. Hmm. Um, the ones that do probably on the days that there's more west in the wind. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Would that be the sort of hedgerow and the road type? Then on, on the road up to Warren side, on the far side of the valley, yeah. on the northern side of the valley, there's a road and a hedgerow. Would that be a thermal picker that you 
I think it's more of you look at it, it's it's and the valley is narrowing, it goes up and then it flattens. And I think just at that point yeah. there is an obvious whether yeah. it's a hedgerow or gap or something. So people are generally following the same track out, isn't it? Yeah. So the odd, odd yeah, I mean at, at this point there's no there's no reason to argue with the wind. Uh it, it's taking everybody where they want to go. So but you, you can see a, that turn. Well, so Dave. That's Dave Smart there in the green. Yeah. Love to know why he decided to do 93 turns to the left. Dave's leaving at a, at a different time than everybody mm -hmm. else. But the thing that's obvious to me is, is that his climb's weakened off here. His track is more northerly. That leads him to cross off over this steep little, it's, it's almost a tributary valley of Bishopdale, which is why he breaks off to go and see what's coming up these two gullies here. And that slope of the claim that he comes off is into the wind as well. Yeah. He's trying to get back over onto the sunny, windward side, wind side. Yeah, the, yeah. So he's, so Dave, I don't think he's too high. He's on a bit of a lifesaver here. Sure. Uh, and he actually does spend quite a bit of time back here. You know, we were on the radio, and I, I was on the radio giving a bit of a ribbon about picking his heels, you know. Uh, and and that, that's the track you took as well, Tom. At, uh, at the same time as Dave? Yeah, he was below me. <laughs> <laughs> so I came, I came up here, um, went across his path about here. This is Buckton Pike here, which is I was heading straight, straight for. Um, I didn't get anything off there. I was thinking I've got to get something here. Sorry for the cut. There's not very good flying. It's not worth knowing. I thought I'm bound to get something here, and I'm not going down here where he is. I didn't know it was very fine. And he was mincing about, so I'm not going down there. And so I bombed out up here, and then as I bombed out, he was just. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you scroll down a bit, made a sort of a run for the sound to a certain point, turned and got it still. Yeah, you, you mean you join join down. this line here? So may, maybe Dave didn't have the height for for going over this set of high ground. Could you scroll out a little bit? So just, yeah, so uh, I haven't talked to Dave about this, so I don't know, but I suspect, because Dave Smart is a lot of excellent time. I wouldn't be surprised he's already written this area off in his head, which is why he decided I ain't gone in there. And he took an end degree turn here to try something else. Yeah, right? Whereas Tam, you don't have the experience of Dave, and you probably went, there's gotta be something here, if there isn't, I'll carry on. Whereas if you look at what the <coughs> done, there's got to be something here. But if there isn't, I ain't going back there anyway. Yeah. So I'm going to go somewhere. Yeah. But there might be something because I know there's nothing back there. Yeah. And it could be that that's fair. Yeah, the situation awareness thing. Because I, I did get so on my track, I plan to take about three turns mm. just about the top of the track. And I don't get anything. And I, I carry on. If I've been watching, I could probably have seen it start, start to climb. Maybe. And I could maybe have got to him. But that, that could well be experience and that there was nothing on the day to tell you that that wasn't the place to go. That could have been, Dave has been in there five times and all the time without his insight and said, I'm never going back in there again. So that could have been just the most experience that you couldn't possibly have because you don't have that experience. So the, the one thing in this second stage that, that is kind of bringing out uh, a theme for me uh, is that at different times, bunches of people have reached the top of the climb, and it's not been okay. Let's just boot it and go to the next. It's not obvious what people are doing next. I, you know, I'm low uh, and concerned <laughs> uh, that I don't have enough height to establish myself. I'm with Joe and somebody else at this point. I can't remember who the. the third person was. Um, but even, even the other folks, you know, there's a difference in tracks. Um, no straight, few straight lines. Exactly. People are holding on because it's early in the day 
and the base is actually quite low. So people are flying very conservatively. Uh, you know, to, to the point of, I'll go back, uh, I'll have a big search around. Looks like they're generally a bit lower of them. When you're about three at the time, most of the people are just about on the floor. You'll very quickly see, if you examine my tracks, I, I tend to spend, spend a bit of time bottom feeding. <laughs> Well, obviously, because, yeah. <laughs> but third part of the flight, you know, I think we already brought this out. People were, did, I mean, did you spot this? Did you spot that people were actually really quite disciplined on choosing this route? This is a motorway. Mm. Uh, and, and if it's, you know, if it's not got a, uh, a stream of thermals, three or four thermals that you can climb in between, you know, what is the top of, I guess, well, that's Cray there, but the top of the, um, what's it called, star bottom rise? Uh, it's got a particular name. Uh, and running all the way to Penn Hill, that's generally a solid uh, 10k level of work. Uh, and actually people, you know, they're generally quite quick flying that section. Was that a theme that, that came up? Yeah. Pete, uh, what was the star yeah. rating for the day? Do you know, can you, do you know what the star rating for the day was? No, I'm, I'm not sure, Simon. Uh, three and four stars. Three, three and four stars, says Tam. Okay. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think that might be influenced a little bit by by the, the low base yeah. for the day. No, I looked back at the chat as well on the flight path group, and it was just that, oh, I might go and have a look at the room, It wasn't, you know, like, I'm going to bed early tonight. Yes. I think so most people didn't. Get, I think most people didn't get over four and a half thousand feet. No, I'd, I'd be surprised if I did. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't see that in, even in Alex's track. I, I think the most he got was about thirteen hundred meters. Yeah. That Alex Burns stayed very. He did. Yeah, he had no low, yeah, no low drops. Yeah. yeah, the other guys we were were much more up and down. You yeah. think yeah. they just keep it together really nicely. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Alex Colbeck's, Alex Colbeck's ele elevation profile, oh, uh, that's just fantastic. He must have had. Such a stress-free day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, the only bit of stress is he's maybe approaching Durham there. He's on his own there. But... He's on his own, but he, he's still at 416 metres. He's still a 1,000 foot above the ground there. So that's, you know, I mean, that, that just says, tactically, he was playing it just fine. We brought out a couple of the themes that I, I wanted the, the split there. Uh, Pete Darwood, David May. Okay, so you, yeah, you were. We split there and all the other guys headed up northeast. Yeah. To get around there, so. And you did your own thing about an hour later, half an hour later. Yeah. He kind of followed the same track. So he followed the end of Pin Hill. Um, I think you went to the west and north of the airspace. He did. Yeah. So we'll get to that because I, again, I was not high enough for a valley crossing. Uh, I was not uh, high enough to start making proper decisions about 
avoiding airspace or going to the west or the east, I have more immediate problems, my height. Uh, and one of, you know, one of the things that I, I certainly picked up was a set of climbs uh, that were coming off the side of the hill. So, I mean, th this is not kind of something I would expect everybody else to pick up, uh, but it's something I, I wanted to bring out about my own flight because I, I remember thinking, well, look, uh, I've got to get across this valley uh, and my thermal triggers um, are not going to be the top of the hill. I'm not far east enough uh, for Penn Hill. I actually got something off, off the slopes on the side of the hill. So, you know, in, in a southwesterly, we're coming up this valley. So even though this is fully westerly facing, you're going to get uh, out of wind direction thermals coming off the side of it. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. You know, there's maybe a little bit happening here. So did you intentionally fly not over the top of the hill? I in, to the it, side? So I intentionally uh, flew across the, the set of limestone edges. Uh, and although, you know, they're, they're facing west, they're not into the sun, there's lots of disruption in the land. You know, there's a valley here. But there's a there's a sort of a side inlet here. There's lots of disruption in the landscape. There's some of it facing into the sun. There's bare rock, and that's all. And, and there's there's a change in elevation. And if there's wind moving that hot air that's been in the valley, even if it's moving that way, as it comes across, it's going to tangentially sort of trigger it. And um, if you got towards the level of the, the top of the hill, you'd be careful when you don't stay to the west of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then, I mean, it, it wasn't mega. You know, I, I, there's, there's two speeds to fly in. There's conservative hang on, uh, and then there's glide, you know, put half bar on because I can see someone flying. Uh, and this was very much conservative, hang on. I've got a lot of alley to cross. I mean, the, thankfully, Penn Hill to, to the quarries here around... Uh, okay. okay. Yeah. It's a, it's a big crossing. Yeah. Big crossing. So, I, you know, if it's zeros, that's a positive thing. <laughs> because with those zeros... Every one of those you're traveling, every turn you're traveling 50, 100 meters further or whatever, uh, without going down. So it's great. <laughs> just be patient, just live with it, just search, refine it. And then that, that kind of gets me across. Uh, there's a whole bunch of sink here. Uh, and I'm actually able to approach kind of the top of the moor. Mm. You were low there, so I, I th in fact, I thought you were going into land. Yeah. I think you thought you were going into land. I had a toe out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but the, there was a reason I turned left as well. I mean, don't forget, Bellaby is, is here. Uh, so if I'd have turned right, that ends my flight very quickly if I find it. A climb in front of Bellaby, I have to turn left, uh, and I was able to connect. I, it it was in cycle, uh, and that's a very strong climb did when it that, established. Did that climb was coming off the top or coming off the bottom of that section in the valley? Mm. Just go up to the top and look down. Yeah, you work yourself up there and look down that pipe. You'll see where it's triggering. See the sideways on. Uh, I I don't know the most movements to do with that. Is it like that? Yeah, you need to shift here as well. 
This is called God Mode. All right, so you can see. There we go. We're looking down the barrel of that thermal now. Yeah. And it's actually, it is, it's coming off the front. There's quite a big ridge here. This quarry is, it's not coming off the top. It's coming off the front, but the drift has brought it over where the height that uh, Pete is at, he's halfway over the moor when we picked it up and we connected with it. Mm. It's obviously coming off the edge there. And there's a line of trees and mm. all of this is rising, rising, rising. And then it rises quite steeply here with that tree line. It's probably been triggered here. And then it's coming up at whatever the, the lean of the thermals were that day generally consistent enough so if you were aware of how much they were leaning you'd have a rough idea of how far back over the moor because if you went too far back you'd have missed it yeah yeah you'd have been underneath it but with with a moor that's kind of on the top that rounded maybe that hot air just keeps in contact with the ground until it really has to mm. let go mm. which is you know which is why I was over uh, over the top of the moor quite a bit. Uh, so as we go out, uh, you know, we've split our way. I mean, I, um, you know, then have to go and deal with the further range. <laughs> Which is why I've got a 90 degree turn here. Please don't repeat this kind of thing. It's, it's stressful. <laughs> Go one side or the other. What, what do people think is the next hazard to cross? It's the sinking bend. Okay. It's a big, big one. Does everybody kind of understand that? A1N corridor. Well, I mean, so the, the A1's kind of, oh, uh, maybe that's the A1 there coming around and then to Donald. Um, but the sinking ground is, is absolutely right. Uh, in the, if you imagine you've got the low flat fields here, you've got ground at kind of 1,500 foot, up to 1500 foot here. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that ground is, is facing away from the sun. So suddenly you've, you've hit a section of ground that is, you know, to me, receiving 10, 15% on average less sun than just normal flat ground. Mm -hmm. uh, which does lead to some difficulties. Um, there was one thing I, I did want to bring out. Did anybody spot this? What's, what's happening here? This is the main gaggle. This is Alex, Chris, Jake. If I said... Uh, if I said this is Swaledale... Framington... What's that, Simon? Remington, Remington Edge. Thank you. Simon says Remington Edge. Let's play Simon Says. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely go, you know, uh, they got low. Uh, Chris, and, Chris and Jake got low. Alex, as you can see from his track, was, was just flying over quite serenely. This is where Alex actually just stole the march and then flew away for, for the rest of the flight. Chris and Jake uh, were absolutely having to, to make use of the, um, of the landscape. But if it's worked at Wind, if it's worked at Wind Bank, there's no reason why it's not going to work 20 miles down the track. Mm. Well, Jake and um, Chris just went a bit deeper. Alex picked up the, um, the climb out front of it. I don't know. We'd have to work out the timings if you got there at the same time. But yeah, Jake and, and Chris got low here and they just decided to, to mm -hmm. soar in front of front of the edge. Give you a bit of time, really. 
stay in the air long enough to pick up the next turn. Um, and then let's just have a little bit of this going on. Uh, so I did have an ideal sort of showing of, of sometimes what you've got to get through uh, when you leave the dales and start flatland flying or rolling rolling hills flying. I mean, it, it was serious enough that, that, that it put Jake on the ground. Um, in his defence, uh, he, he was uh, not the most compass mentors that day. No. He wasn't. No. Okay. Poor lad. Um, but you can see from I, I top out here uh, after you know tremendous climb coming off uh, off the moor. Uh, had a bit of time topping out, mincing about, having a sandwich or two, uh, and from let's say fifty k to at least seventy. 2k, but for the sake of argument, because I got lower, 76, 77k, 27k, I had suppressed lift. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it, it, it's uh, perhaps that's an extreme example, but that is the amount of, you know, you think climb, climb, climb. Uh, and then, you know, lots of flying, lots of mincing. This is mincing. Is that about 15 minutes? Yeah. No, it'll be more. No. Um, you know, your trim speed is around 38k an hour. So 27k is about 40 minutes. You know, unless you're booting around and back. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, mincing and then... You can see here that I'm still mincing and I'm going down at a, I'm, I'm still going down, probably whilst I'm turning actually. 20 times start losing faith. <laughs> Until, you know, losing hope. To, turning round, you're losing height. You think, okay, travel. Still, you're still making distance. You're still, still making distance, but. You know, I mean, that you're on a losing game now. If you're going down at half a meter a second uh, in, to, in, a, in a climb, and, which still means that there's rising air, but if you're still going down in it, it, it is perhaps time to leave it. Uh, you know, and speed to fly for the day probably should have said, if I, if I didn't hit two meters a second, I should have just carried on. <laughs> um, but yeah, tw 27 K. Okay. Um, uh, Alex was was higher up, so he was probably able to fly cloud to cloud much more effectively. You've got you, you know you've got more options, you've got better visibility, you've got a, a bigger spread to just adjust five degrees that way or that way. And, and for those rolling um, hills. Are you using speed bar to get over it? Uh, I'll, I'll use speed bar when I'm, I need to sink on a glide, or I can see some sign of climbing and I want to get there quickly because it, even if you're going downwind, it doesn't matter. Once you've seen that that sign of a climb, you you need to get there quickly as quickly as possible, mm. and it doesn't matter if you lose. 50 extra meters doing it because you'll make up those 50 extra meters in I don't know however many seconds if it's a four meter or three meter a second climb 10 20 seconds in the climb but one turn it's one turn in the climb so yeah speed bar to to get through sync obviously but also to 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 get to where you need to go for a climb um don't do this. <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, so I eventually bottom out. 
kind of around here. Pierce Bridge, the Peace Bridge. Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, some numbers of some trees high, probably about three trees high or, or four trees high. Um, the, the point I wanted to bring out is if it's safe to do so, there's air that hasn't properly triggered yet, but it's still a bubble of hot air that's rising, that has circulation in it. And, and so that is, you know, that's my life. I don't, I don't really have a major climb out of here. It, you know, you see that, that graph. It's not as steep as this one here, obviously. But uh, for a lot of this, I'm actually very tied to the landscape. So, so one thing to bring out here is that uh, you can sit with a bubble that's rolling along the landscape with, with the wind, and, and you can see the wind's gone a little bit more south here. Uh, and just see where it takes you. I mean, it, it did take, it take me eventually to heady heights of nearly 2,000 feet. <laughs> Uh, but at the, you know, at this point, I'm uh, I'm kind of struggling a little bit to establish myself, uh, and and that that kind of thing can be difficult to break from if if you've got if you're flat flat flatland flying, and there's no obvious decent sources and, and triggers nearby. I'm I'm over a very even slope at this point. It's very zen-like. Uh, but yeah, I mean that that's you know re really what I wanted to bring out was the change in the speed of, of your flight, the change in the amount of patience you've got to have to, to slow down, to top out, to keep conservative. Uh, as you cross to uh, to low ground and get established again. Um, now, just coming back out again. Ed, this is Ed. This is me. This is the gaggle. Any, what, what strikes you as being different for the location wise? Ed went away from the high ground quite early. He did? Yeah. Anything else? This was only noted in what stayed by the ground for longer. Yeah. So, I mean, Ed perhaps had the, had the height and he, he, he was certainly consistently climbing and gliding uh, and didn't seem to have a lot of trouble. But uh, the folks here, uh, because they'd uh, made the, the decision to avoid Felden and, and Bellaby to the west, that also put them in a really good stead for staying over the high ground longer, uh, which obviously worked for for Alex and Chris there. Uh, Jake a bit less so, but uh, let's not blame him for that on the day. But as for that routing decision, uh, this is Castle Barnard, by the way. Um, anything obvious here? Chris and Jake are separate. There's, there's probably... 20 minutes between you, 15 minutes. Well, it looks like Chris and Yellow went for the high ground. Different window. Right? Well, there is a bit, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Chris, I mean, Chris is going to see himself as, as separating from the track a little bit more from, uh, from Newcastle. Well, he's obviously cross funded here between this terminal and this terminal. He has, yeah. You know, cross winding is a conscious decision, it's not random. So 
why is he crosswinding? I guess it's because he's trying to connect to this higher ground up here. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. or maybe so, maybe so a cloud and he kind of worked it out and said terminal is there, so he, he crosswinded. Maybe we, we don't have this guy, so we don't know. But those kind of, I find these kind of um, moves are interesting because they're a conscious thing. These don't happen randomly. Straight lines have to happen kind of subconsciously, but when somebody makes a decision like that, if I spot it, I generally ask them why. They might remember it, they might not. Uh, so I asked Chris today, he couldn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It seemed like a good idea at the time. So <laughs> I'm going to make it up. <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think we're on the right lines. He's cross-winded because this is back onto the higher ground. The, these these pennines, they'll, they'll take you up to Kielder, up, up to Hexham, and Otterburn. You keep going that way. And, and even though it's a southwesterly and you're you cross winding slightly. So you think you must have seen some of that? I think they were like yeah. disconnected mm -hmm. some of that area. Straight across, isn't it? This way, at yeah. this point. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas yeah. you're just headed for the high ground and when you see a turn. Yeah, so I mean, you can see the, the gully of the river valley here. So all of this is rising ground. And this might itself might be a little peak here. You often get ridge lines of trees at the peaks of hills as well as kind of at the bottom. Here, I think he's trying to repeat it again. <laughs> Uh, and, and has a, you know, a few goes at something or other uh, and never really connects. And, the, you know, this is, uh, well, he's starting at 11.30, he's 75k in, so it's, it's, it's like going on for three in the afternoon uh, at the most. I, I, I think for me, you know, Chris has made a, a decision here that's that's been totally right. He's been at the top of a climb, so he's probably made that for, for a cloud. Uh, or at least a, a, a bird. Uh, he's tried to repeat it. Uh, he's tried to repeat it here uh, and then found you know, maybe he's lost quite a bit of height and, and had to come round the front of the hill to see what's scooshing up up the south side of it. And unfortunately, nothing. So doing the right thing can fail <laughs> sometimes. Anything, anybody else kind of has a thought from that day about... Because that's that's about all all I wanted to bring out. Uh, except that acro to the point of space absolutely required. That looks fine. Was it going there? So there's a whole bunch of airspace that you start hitting around Washington. Uh, and he's been uh, from his goal. Shapes it. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we didn't touch on is um, most people work with for you in the sky, uh, and it's, it's not reasonable in the UK to expect people to wait too long because thermos don't last long enough. You know, and everybody was out flying has their own goals they want to achieve. So the best way is uh, group up with a couple of mates, fly together. You know, fly with other people on the hill, but you'll find that you tend to naturally group into sort of your, your silos, fly together and support each other, and talk about your flights afterwards, and figure out these decision points, you know, why did you go left there when I went right? You know, I went down, you didn't. Why? What happened there? Did you see something I didn't see? You know, or was it just random? Was it just luck? Um, hopefully it's not just luck, because then you can't learn from it. Hopefully there was something you missed. Um, pretty much it then. So we'll collect a bit of feedback. We'll organise a next session with some homework uh, with tracks from a different hill. 
uh, and then we'll go on to use some different tools uh, and we'll bring out uh, some of the, uh, the decisions for different tactics of, uh, of flying it. So the only thing...